Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Okay, uh, cosmic rays. All of our information about the universe comes in the form of electromagnetic radiation, that is, uh, light, infrared, ultraviolet, radio signals, x-rays, and so on. But there is another flux reaching our Earth from space, energetic nuclear particles called cosmic rays. Just as a brief outline, I'd like to start with some simple definitions, uh, just to uh, make sure you all have the background appropriate talk about the history, the discovery of cosmic rays, a few words about detectors, and then I'd like to break the cosmic ray spectrum into three energy regions, the low, middle energy, and the very high energy. And in the latter part, I'll be uh, using information from the very recent experiments of uh, the OJ collaboration which I'll tell you about later. Okay, um, a few years ago, it's interesting, the American Physical Society decided to form a new division in this area of physics. Uh, there are other divisions in the American Physical Society, a division of nuclear physics, high energy physics, or elementary particle physics, I guess, and uh, atomic, molecular, and optical physics, and so on. Well. The first idea was to call this a division of cosmic ray physics, but people objected. They thought, oh, there you are. that's kind of an out-of-date term, so it seems, uh, it, so instead it's called the division of astrophysics. And, uh, okay, this area of science is usually in contemporary discussions referred to as astroparticle physics or particle astrophysics or simply just astrophysics. Well, anyhow, uh, first, a little introduction, just to remind you, we'll be dealing with very, very large and very, very small uh, numbers. Uh, we'll use exponents of 10 to represent the large and small numbers. For example, 10 squared is 100, 10 to the minus 3 is 1 over 1,000. And then we have these prefixes million, billion, trillion, and quadrillion, and so on, uh, mega, giga. Interesting that the word billion, it is an English term. In European countries, biard means a trillion. So uh, the term giga, or the prefix giga, gia, the letter G, be it rather than B, came to be more universally adopted for 10 to the ninth. Anyhow, uh, units of energy and mass, just to note the meter kilogram second system of units, which is universal in modern physics. Uh, the unit of energy is the joule, mass, the kilogram, uh, distance, meters, and seconds for time, of course. And a watt is one joule per second. A kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, and electrically, the unit of charge is a coulomb, uh, electrical potential is a volt, and a 100 watt light bulb is uh, what you get with a, an ampere flowing uh, over through a potential of about 100 volts. Anyhow, elementary particles, uh, the proton, the electron, uh, mass of a proton is about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms, and its electric charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Uh, so it's a very, very tiny thing. The electron mass is even smaller, 10 to the minus 9 times 10 to the minus 31st. Uh, a convenient unit of energy is the electron volt, that is, the energy an electron would have, kinetic energy, accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. 
And, of course, in view of the electric charge of an electron, that's only 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Now, it's convenient in high energy physics to represent mass as energy over C squared. Uh, view the relativistic relationship between mass and energy, E equals mc squared. So the mass of a proton in those units is just under a billion uh, volts over C squared, or electron volts over C squared, or 938 MeV over C squared. Of an electron, it's about a half an MeV over C squared, or 511 kilovolts over C squared. Okay, so much for the uh, background. Now, a little history. In 1912, radioactivity in X-rays had been discovered. A detector technology in those days was an electroscope. And in fact, let me give you a little example of an electroscope. Um, the point is, here is a little pivot rod, and it's very nearly perfectly balanced, and so it takes a very little force to hold it out. Now, if the rod and this uh, piece here have the same electric charge, and they're electrically connected at the pivot, then the electric charge, the mutual or same charges repel, and so this thing will be pushed away. So I here have here a little generator, and I'll go sing. Uh, here. There. Okay, see, so it stands away. And if I discharge this, electric charge would leak through my finger. Okay, goes back. Now, uh, could we set up that gadget over there? This is an electroscope that is on a projector, and uh, there is a radioactive source. Now, if I put a radioactive source uh, on, first we charge it up, and there it goes, whoa, it goes way over. But if we then put a radioactive source there, the radioactive source produces, um, well, the charged particles racing through the air ionize the air. And the ionized air is electrically conducting. And so the radioactive source causes uh, the ions, uh, causes the charge to leak off of the electroscope and the uh, vein of the electroscope will collapse. So I put on the source and, whoops, and now uh, over time, you can see that thing leak off. Okay, go slowly, but okay, there you are. Uh, now, Victor Hess knew about electroscopes, and he found that as you went up in elevation, an electroscope discharged more rapidly than just down here at sea level. Although even at sea level, it slowly discharged, even without introducing any obvious uh, radioactive source. And in fact, he took an electroscope up in a balloon and found that indeed in, an in a balloon, the thing discharged even faster. And that led him to the conclusion that there was radiation coming from outer space incident on the Earth's atmosphere and in the uh, uh, atmosphere absorbed some of it so that by the time we were down at sea level, under the depth of the Earth's atmosphere, there is much less. So uh, he concluded that there was this radiation and that that was, in fact, uh, what were called cosmic rays. Uh, well, it's just the same thing I've been saying. Um, so uh, he is the discoverer of cosmic rays, or he's given that credit. Okay. Uh, now, at uh, that time in the 1912, 1920s, it was thought that the uh, cosmic rays were really 
uh, X-rays or gamma rays. It wasn't until the 1930s that it was learned that cosmic rays are indeed particles. It is now understood that primary cosmic rays are indeed atomic nuclei, protons, alpha particles, and indeed heavier uh, nuclei up to and elements including iron. Uh, heavier nuclei are also there, but uh, much less common. Uh, neutrinos are also incident on the Earth and may be called cosmic rays, and sometimes uh, very, very um, energetic uh, gamma rays, uh, trillions of volt gamma rays are included in cosmic rays. Okay, it's probably worth spending a few minutes talking about detectors. Geiger counters, earliest 20th century electronic counters, typically they were uh, cylindrical tubes with a wire in the middle and uh, filled with gas, a high voltage on the central wire, and when a cosmic ray particle went through, an ionizing particle, gas was ionized, the gas became electrically conducting, and an electric current pulse uh, popped across between the cylinder and the anode wire, and you got an electrical signal. Okay, uh, cloud chambers uh, came in in the 1930s and through the 1950s, and we have a cloud chamber here that uh, Warren Smith has uh, provided for us. And here the idea is that you have a gas which has a uh, vapor in it of uh, water or liquid, and this uh, gas is, or uh, the vapor is at a super um, unstable state so that some disturbance will cause the vapor to condense into droplets. And uh, what would cause the vapor to condense into droplets? Well, ions, ionization. And a high energy charged particle going through the uh, vapor leaves a trail of uh, charged gas ions and they form condensation nuclei for water droplets. So you see these chains of water droplets and that's what forms these uh, uh, trails, these tracks, is a radioactive source in here of alpha particles. And so this technology became a very, very widespread and uh, valuable technology in, for studying cosmic rays in the 19 of uh, 30s through the 50s. Now, scintillation counters are uh, very nice gadgets also. Um, the point is some plastics, certain plastics with certain chemicals dissolved in them give off light, ultraviolet or purple light, when a charged particle passes through them. And that little flash of light can be detected by a photomultiplier. Now we have a photomultiplier here. This is just a very little uh, two inch diameter thing. The point is that one end of it, this is the photocathode. When light strikes that, electrons are given off and they go into the, uh, they're focused into this structure and they strike a piece of metal uh, and more electrons are kicked out of the metal by one electron hitting it. So you get an electron multiplication and a cascade of about 10 of these different electrodes give you a pulse which is electrically easily detected at the output end when just a single photon or two strike the cathode. So, these scintillation counters using um, plastic and then viewed by photomultipliers are very useful and practical cosmic ray devices. We have some over here wrapped up in black paper and tape. Black tape are scintillator slabs and at each side is 
a photomultiplier looking through a tapered piece of plastic. And there's one here and one here. A cosmic ray which passes through this and this gives a uh, pulse in each and the electronics detects when the two pulses are in time coincidence and tells you that there has been a cosmic ray passing through. And the little ticks you hear here are due to cosmic rays. Now in a few minutes I'll tell you what those cosmic rays are, but okay. On the detector discussion, okay. Well, uh, I should also note here that besides the scintillation counters, um, another phenomenon which is relevant for detecting cosmic rays is Cherenkov radiation. Uh, if a charged particle passes through a substance where the velocity of light in that substance is lower than the velocity of the particle, what you do is you generate this so-called Cherenkov radiation. The simple analogy with which you're all familiar is a boat. If you have a boat going slowly through the water, uh, okay, you have little ripples and so on. But if the boat is speeding, if it's a speedboat, you're all familiar with the fact that there is a wave that comes from the bow of the boat. And a V-shaped wave propagates away from the boat as the boat speeds along. It's, we call it a bow shock. And exactly this, an analogous phenomenon is the production of radiation by a charged particle going through a dielectric medium. So this light f discovered and named by a uh, Russian scientist, Cherenkov, is called Cherenkov radiation. Now, in uh, various uh, liquids and plastics and glass, it's obvious that the index of refraction is one and a quarter, one and a half, something like that. So velocity of light is uh, two thirds or so three quarters of what it is in vacuum. And so there's obviously Cherenkov radiation. Even air has a finite density and the velocity of light in air is less than it is in vacuum. So, although it's much less intense, there is Cherenkov radiation produced by uh, charged particles moving at essentially at the velocity of light through air. Uh, I should also note, and it isn't on my transparency, that nitrogen in particular, when um, charged particles pass through, does emit a small quantity of ultraviolet scintillation light. So that, uh, although it's not very useful in a small experiment, in some of the larger experiments, which we come to later, uh, this is relevant. I should also note that silicon detectors and other more modern things are very relevant to cosmic ray experiments. Superconducting magnets, for example. Uh, so the cosmic ray technology makes use of the devices which are used throughout the rest of physics. Okay, next slide I'll show cosmic ray spectrum. And we're talking about a range of energies from 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 20th electron volts and a flux, which goes all the way. Now, this is kind of a uh, confusing slide. In the first place, if you can't read it, the flux is in particles per square meter, per steradian, per second, per billion electron volts, or per GeV. And this runs from 10 to the fourth, all the way down to 10 to the minus 28. In other words, over 32 orders of magnitude. That's a long range. And in energies from 10 to the ninth electron volts, or a billion electron volts, up to 10 to the 20th electron volts. And this is a spectrum of cosmic rays, more or less as known. This dotted line is an approximate curve 
but the real spectrum actually deviates a little bit. There are two characteristics here. One is what's called the knee, a break in the spectrum at a couple times 10 to the 15th electron volts. And then there's a, another feature, a break in the spectrum called the ankle up here at about 10 to the 18th. Well, sometimes a more useful curve, whoo, excuse me, is this one. This is an integral spectrum. That means for every point here, for example, that point, uh, there are uh, 10 to the minus fourth particles per square meter per second per steradian at and above this energy. Well, that's not a very high flux. But you get down here, and over on the right side, there's a flux per square kilometer per year per steradian. And at energies of the order of 10 to the 19th, that means there's only about one particle per square kilometer per year uh, at and above 10 to the 19th electron volts. The wide width of this thing represents the uncertainty. In fact, there are some uncertainties here. Uh, now, the two energy scales. Down here is the energy scale we've just been dealing with, the energy of the cosmic rays. But on the top, if the cosmic rays are protons, and many of them are, when a proton strikes another proton, the energy available in the center of mass, that is the energy available to do something interesting and unusual, uh, is very much less because so much energy goes to knocking the other proton forward. The center of mass energy in trillion electron volts goes from 0.1 to 100 at that line, while the uh, energy of the cosmic ray goes from, well, 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 19th or so. So um, these are center of mass energies. Now, one reason for putting those there is that down here, I have th four bars which represent the center of mass energies made available in high energy accelerator colliding beam machines. Uh, here is the intersecting storage rings at CERN, built in about 1965. Uh, another collider at CERN, ASP bar PS, uh, about 400 GeV in the center of mass. Uh, and uh, the Tevatron Collider at uh, Fermilab in Illinois, which Myron Campbell's involved with, producing about uh, 2 trillion volts in the center of mass, equivalent to about 2 times 10 to the 15th electron volt cosmic ray. And here is the Large Hadron Collider nearing completion at the CERN laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland, which will produce an energy equivalent to a cosmic ray of about 10 to the 17th electron volts, that is uh, 14 trillion electron volts in the center of mass. Now, somebody was pointing out to me, and I've heard this discussion before, that some people in Europe are upset about the Large Hadron Collider. They say, my gosh, suppose producing these particles, this tremendous amount of energy uh, gives us a big surprise. Suppose it produces black holes that wind up swallowing up the Earth. My gosh, what are we going to do? And in fact, somebody's brought a lawsuit against the CERN organization. Well, the answer to that is very simple. The Earth has been bombarded for its existence by cosmic rays with much more energy than the Large Hadron Collider will provide. So don't worry about that, but you might wonder what might happen if a cosmic ray hits you. OK. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, OK, let's talk about low energy cosmic rays. This is the range of energies where the flux is low enough so it can be studied directly with balloon-borne or satellite-borne detectors above the atmosphere. And these can include magnetic spectrometers and so on. 
Uh, I list down at the bottom of that transparency a few of the particular um, devices that have been used, including uh, AMS, which is the uh, program that Professor Ting is involved in and mentioned in his talk two weeks ago. Uh, he originally called that the antimatter spectrometer, but NASA decided it was better to call it something that didn't include the word anti, so it's called the alpha, magne alpha magnetic spectrometer now. <laughs> Okay, now generally agreed that the source of most of these primary cosmic rays in this energy region is shock wave acceleration associated with supernovas. That is, a supernova is a star which has burned down to a point where it then explodes dramatically. And uh, the technology is explained by the experts. I won't take time to go into it here, but there is very good reason to believe that this is the source of these cosmic rays. The composition of the cosmic rays is somewhat similar to the composition we know to be uh, the composition of stars and other matter in our uh, galaxy and universe, uh, that known spectroscopically, and of course the cosmic rays are identified in these uh, uh, cosmic ray events. Here is a graph at energies of billions of volts of the relative abundances of elements in stars, which are the black circles connected by the dotted line, and the abundance, relative abundance of cosmic ray nuclei, open circles connected by the solid line. Now, in uh, many of the elements, the compositions are similar. I, fact, I think the graphs were normalized to silicon, for example. And the interesting point is that some of these nuclei in our uh, stellar compositions are very, very much less abundant than they are in cosmic rays. This is well understood now as the consequence of the, some of the more abundant nuclei, like carbon and oxygen, neon, for example, experiencing collisions with the residual gas and dust in interstellar space in our galaxy and undergoing a nuclear breakup so that if a few nucleons are knocked out of a carbon nucleus, it becomes a boron or beryllium or perhaps a lithium nucleus. Uh, well which means that they're much more abundant in cosmic rays than they are in the stellar atmosphere. And uh, so this is relatively understood, relatively well understood. Um, the next slide, well, these are uh, the energies per nucleon of uh, iron, carbon, helium, and hydrogen in cosmic rays up to a few billion electron volts per nucleon. Uh, okay, now uh, just to show you what is happening, here is uh, a, an Italian uh, satellite-borne uh, detector which was launched last year, and I don't know any of the physics results from it yet, but again, here is a magnet uh, the particle momentum can be determined by tracking the particle through the magnet, detectors above, and a so-called calorimeter to measure the total energy of a hadronic particle or nucleus below. Now, an interesting aside is the issue of antimatter. And again, uh, Professor Ting touched on this a couple of weeks ago, and it is interesting. The apparent asymmetry of the universe the lack of primordial antimatter remains an unresolved mystery. The standard model of particle physics suggests that the Big Bang origin of the universe should have resulted in as much antimatter as matter. Why we have a matter-dominated universe is a mystery. Is it perhaps due to CP uh, uh, non-conservation? Well, um, 
If there were antimatter galaxies or galactic clusters, antibaryonic cosmic rays from them might well diffuse to the vicinity of our galaxy. However, for billion, trillion volt energies, the local galactic magnetic field, our galaxy along the spiral arms has a magnetic field of the order of a microgauss, would actually contains the cosmic ray nuclei for literally millions of years. The age of the cosmic rays in the billion, trillion volt range has been determined by the isotope uh, beryllium-10, which is radioactive, with a lifetime of the order of a million years. And so by looking at the abundance of beryllium-10 to other isotopes in that range, we can get a measure of the age of the cosmic rays. And this leads to the conclusion that these cosmic rays are, uh, they've been around for a long time at these energies. Now, therefore, because the galaxy acts like a bottle containing the cosmic rays, it is correspondingly difficult for an extragalactic cosmic ray of those energies to come into the field. And uh, so it may be necessary to have ten sensitivities the order of one particle in 10 to the 10th uh, to detect these extragalactic cosmic rays. Nevertheless, the antimatter spectrometer program, or the alpha magnetic spectrometer program, would like to do this and would like to look, put their instrument on the International Space Station. Well, they're having big funding troubles with NASA. NASA currently has put its emphasis on putting people on Mars and so on. So there's a big problem. But OK, uh, Ting is a good politician. We'll see. Uh, this is Ting's detector he used on a space shuttle uh, experiment a couple of years ago and produced some very nice physics. So it is going forward. OK. Uh, now, antiprotons are not what you want to look for. You want to look for anti-carbon or anti-helium. The point is that we know if we have a high energy accelerator that a proton striking another nucleus will make occasionally an antiproton. And so we do see antiprotons in these experiments. The dotted lines are those calculated, knowing the age of the cosmic rays in the galaxy and the spectrum. And these various points are from a whole mess of different experiments, including the 2002 AMS experiment. And we see that, uh, in fact, there, there is about one in a million to one in 10,000 antiprotons per proton over these energies up to billions of volts. OK. Well, end of the antiproton thing. Let's go on to higher energies. Between uh, up to above 300, 500 trillion volts, the flux is too low to be studied by satellites and balloons. And so we have to use ground level observations. Now, the energetic uh, cosmic rays entering the atmosphere initiate what are called air showers which produce a rain of particles which can be detected on the Earth's surface with detectors spread over a broad area. So we'll talk about these intermediate energies, 300 TeV to 100 PeV or so. OK, when a primary cosmic ray enters the atmosphere, it has a collision with an air nucleus and produces pi mesons, nucleons, protons and neutrons, occasionally heavier hadrons, which rain forward, mostly produced forward because the momentum of the instant particle. The charged pi mesons decay to a mu meson and a neutrino. The neutral pi mesons decay promptly into two gamma rays. Some fraction of the pions, of course, have a nuclear interaction before they decay, producing, in fact, more pions. And the gammas produce electron-positron pairs which produce more gammas by Bremsstrahlung. The resulting electromagnetic cascade produces a rain of electrons and gamma rays on the Earth's surface, and also muons and some hadrons. This is a schematic diagram of an air shower. See the uh, primary cosmic ray hits the top of the atmosphere, 
Uh, over here are the gammas and electrons separated, not because they're separated in space, but just graphically so you can identify them. In the right hand are the pions decaying to muons, and the muons, since they are weakly interacting particles, to be sure lose some energy by ionization, but mostly reach the Earth's surface, unless they are slow enough energy to decay into electrons and neutrinos before they reach the Earth. And then some of the nucleons, protons and neutrons, uh, eventually reach the Earth's surface, although uh, their cross-section is high enough, so most of them have uh, dissipated by the time they get to the Earth. Uh, well, this is a graph, for example, for an incident energy of 10 to the 15th, or 1 PeV, 10 to the 15th electron volts. Here is the depth in the atmosphere in grams per square centimeter. You know, the atmosphere is about 1,000 grams per square centimeter. That means above one square centimeter of atmosphere, the column of air weighs a kilogram. Or, in more familiar terms, perhaps above a square inch, the column of air to the top of the atmosphere weighs 14.7 pounds. Okay, well, uh, uh, here is the altitude in kilometers. So three kilometers is about 10,000 feet, for example. So these are mountain elevations here. Okay. Here are the number of electrons produced on the average as a function of height in the atmosphere. For proton primaries, that's this curve, and for uh, iron primaries, this curve. The iron primaries produce more electrons early on and then they uh, attenuated and fall away more rapidly than that from protons. At the same time, if you measure the mu mesons from proton and iron primaries, uh, this is uh, as a function of depth in the atmosphere. Uh, so as you see, if we're sitting near the Earth's surface, measure electrons and mu mesons, uh, the higher the ratio of mu mesons to electrons, the more probable it is that the primary is a heavy nucleus than uh, lower ratio of muons to electrons are uh, probably protons or lighter nuclei. Now, uh, the fact that these muons are penetrating particles, they've gone through the atmosphere, they even go through the roof of buildings. And that's the point of this little demonstration here. What we're seeing here are mu mesons from cosmic rays which interacted high in the atmosphere, passing through these two scintillator slabs. And these two slabs are in coincidence, which means we only get a count and make a tick when a particle goes through this and this within a time interval of a fraction of a microsecond of each other. And uh, so um, we, if you want to look Put it this way, if we go outdoors at this elevation, close to sea level, per square centimeter, um, we are experiencing about one cosmic ray per minute. Uh, and if you have counters and detectors, that can be seen. Now, if you go high in the atmosphere, you detect um, uh, primary cosmic rays. One tech Detector technology I did not mention are nuclear emulsions. As you know, of course, if you strike a, um, <clears throat> a particular uh, substance inside a photographic film with light, it separates the silver nucleus from the uh, rest of the molecule. And so when you develop it, you get little granules of silver, which cause you to see a film. Now, a charged particle going through nuclear emulsion has the same effect. That is, a charged particle will leave a trail of little 
uh, silver granules, which when the film is developed, you can then see as a track. Now, what the cosmic ray people have done is build very, very large blocks, uh, slabs of nuclear emulsion, which are millimeters thick, and they stack these together and then expose them, for example, in a high altitude balloon, and then develop them. Well, I didn't put this on a transparency, but this was given me by a British cosmic ray physicist. This is a nuclear emulsion reconstruction, and there are many, many pieces of emulsion here that have been uh, put together to show this. This is a, an incident primary iron nucleus with an energy of the order of 20 trillion electron volts. And uh, his calculation, his reading of this, is that there were about 750 mesons produced. And you see all these tracks. Uh, here is the incident iron nucleus. Of course, iron has an electric charge of the order of 28 times that of a proton. So the ionization is very significant there. Here is a collision. And most of the particles go forward, but you see tracks coming out in every direction. And these have all been developed. So this historically was a useful and valuable technology in cosmic rays. OK. And OK. Well, let's go ahead. Um, this is the overall cosmic ray spectrum through this, uh, well, primarily the intermediate energy region uh, from about here to here. These are data from direct observations. Uh, and then up here, things are a little more confusing. OK. Uh, and again, the point of this is that, again, the, the scale here is multiplied by energy cubed. So where the curve is relatively horizontal, it means that the energy the spectrum is falling as energy cubed. Uh, the energy spectrum is falling less rapidly here which is why the curve is going up. And then here is this so-called knee I was discussing. OK. Now, a major problem in this energy region is the interpretation of the ground level data. It depends on understanding the primary interaction, and data from these energies are not yet available from accelerators. We hope that the Large Hadron Collider at CERN will provide some. Uh, this impacts the understanding of the elemental composition more than the energy. It appears that the primary composition is becoming heavier through this knee region. This is from uh, Jim Matthews' uh, talk a couple years ago. What is plotted here is the average of the natural logarithm of the mass number. Uh, uh, if it were pure hydrogen, uh, the log of the mass number one is 0. If it were pure iron, the natural log of 56 is about 4. Uh, so what is clear is that there is a mix of nuclei present. And in fact, these points down here are from direct observations. But there is very significant confusion in understanding the mass composition of cosmic rays in this energy. These are from two different kinds of observation. These are from ground level measurements. These are from measurements using optical devices, that is, air Cherenkov radiation and air scintillation. And uh, the point is, there's a lot we don't know. Well, it would be a Inappropriate not to note here that during the 30s and 40s, uh, a lot of new elementary particles were discovered in cosmic rays. Positrons, mu mesons, pi mesons, kaons, uh, in fact, particles containing the strange quark, hyperons, and so on. In fact, when the first multi-billion volt accelerator was completed at Brookhaven in 1952, it was called the Cosmotron. 
And well, okay, because it was able to mimic the cosmic ray discoveries in effect. Okay, what is responsible for the break in spectrum of the knee? Well, for one thing, it's probably the upper limit of this supernova shock acceleration. Another is that it's uh, from reasonable calculation, an upper limit to the galactic confinement of cosmic rays, that is, this one microgauss in the uh, oh, what, 100 kiloparsecs scale of the galactic arms is uh, about, you know, well, it's called the leaky box model. It's not very effective in containing particles above a few uh, times 10 to the 15th electron volts. Uh, in either case, heavier nuclei would be accelerated and contained in the galaxy to higher energies than lighter nuclei, which would explain why the average mass composition increases. Still, displays of existing data show vast uncertainties. It is appropriate to note here, since we're at the University of Michigan, that one of our faculty members, uh, Yukio Tomozawa, has a theory that there may be a very massive neutral particle with a mass of the order of a PEV, 10 to the 15th electron volts, which is a major source of cosmic rays and which is responsible for the knee. To be sure, his theory is still unproven, but worth noting. Okay, let's talk about the highest energy cosmic rays in the last few minutes. Great interest in the high energy cosmic rays over the range between 10 to the 17th and 10 to the 20th electron volts. Note that a 10 to the 20th electron volt cosmic ray is equivalent to 16 joules approximately. That is equivalent to a one kilogram mass. I should have asked Warren for a one kilogram mass. Drop from about five feet. <laughs> uh, and um, that this just a fundamental particle, probably a proton, has that energy. That's pretty remarkable. But to understand the spectrum and so forth, very large detector rays must be used, and it's used in view of the very small flux, particles per square kilometer per year. A most notable recent program to study these extreme energies is the Pierre Auger Observatory in Argentina. Pierre Auger was a French physicist who in the late 1930s first discovered extensive air showers. Okay, now I'm gonna use transparencies that were given me by Jim Matthews, who's a member of this Pierre Auger collaboration, was on our staff here at Michigan for many years, is now a full professor at uh, University of Louisiana. Okay, and here's just a recall of some of the energy scale, uh, 10 to the 21st electron volts, one ZeV is 160 joules. And for trying to think of a name to call these things, uh, that energy scale, a, you could call it a Tyson or a Clemens or a Harry or a Curly. Okay, okay. Well, here's the location of the uh, Pierre Auger Observatory. They want to build one also in North America, probably Western Colorado, but currently uh, they have support from Argentina and have this facility in Argentina. This is an aerial view um, of the place where the array is, and I think that is roughly, or, yeah, I don't know. Anyhow, this is a flat area uh, where the Santiago Chile is over there. I think this is a satellite view. It's from a big distance. Okay, this is a diagram of the way the thing works. What they have are these, uh, in blue here, these containers which are basically containing purified water and on top they have photomultipliers which detect the Cherenkov radiation of the electrons and the mu mesons coming through the tanks. And here's a man, so you get a picture, a feeling for the scale of this thing something like 10 or 12 feet in diameter and uh, four or five feet high. And the little panels here are solar panels, so each of these things is independently powered. 
and the data is broadcast uh, using basically cell phone technology to a central station. And then they have these telescope arrays to look at the atmospheric scintillation light produced by the cosmic ray air shower along the way. And this is again a diagrammatic representation of an air shower. Uh, here, another view showing both detector systems. Here are two uh, rays of telescopes, uh, so they get a ste stereoscopic picture of the cascade. And here, an array of the ground detectors, and with, from the relative timing of the incidence of the particles on these detectors, they get a measure of the direction from which the air shower is falling. And in fact, this disk diagrammatically represents the fact that all these particles traveling at the speed of light arrive at the ground within a meter or two of each other uh, in longitudinal position or a fraction of a, oh, a very small fraction of a microsecond. But of course, uh, over a distance laterally of a kilometer or more, there is adequate time difference to get the direction. Now, this is a little diagram again of a, a cascade of particles. And uh, if I had a, a fancier projector, this thing actually moves in time, but I don't, so we'll skip that. Uh, OK, and this is the array. Now, these detectors, here's a map, are deployed at a spacing of one and a half kilometers. There are about 1,600 detectors. And the area of this whole array, then, is about 3,000 square kilometers. So that's necessary to get adequate data in a finite number of years with up to energies over 10 to the 20th electron volts. And then these uh, telescopes looking at the fluorescent light from the air showers uh, are located at these four locations. Each container, each little housing contains six telescopes. And uh, incidentally, a problem, the telescope arrays looking at the air scintillation are only useful at a dark night. So uh, bright moonlight and night or a cloudy night, you can't get data there. The shower, the surface detectors, of course, work all the time. But the average useful fraction of the time of the uh, atmospheric fluorescence detectors is only about 5%. This is a photograph of one of the surface detectors. and. Uh, here, uh, a couple of guys working on one, so you get to measure the scale. Of course, this is in a field where the cattle graze, and they don't bother the cosmic rays, and cosmic rays don't bother them. This is the uh, atmospheric uh, fluorescence telescope array. Here inside is one of them. There is a spherical mirror, a corrector lens, and then this array of 440 multipli photomultipliers, like this one that we looked at earlier. And uh, so they, this is what is used to look at the atmospheric fluorescence. OK. Um, this work was on the, featured on the covers of Science Magazine uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and the critical outcome was the following. Each little circle, or ellipse, represents one incident cosmic ray, its direction, where the energy was at least about 6 times 10 to the 19th electron volts, whopping energy. And each little x here represents uh, an astronomical object called an AGN, or an active galactic nucleus. Most of the cosmic rays in this energy range 
are coincident within the resolution of the instrument of an active galactic nuclei, an active galactic nu nucleus called an AGN. So the current understanding, and of course data continues to be collected, is that the very highest energy cosmic rays come to us from AGNs. Now I should note that one, we talked about the bending of cosmic rays in the magnetic field of our galaxy. There is a magnetic field outside the galaxy, but it's very small. I mean, we talk about a microgauss in the galaxy. It's presumably a, a hundredth or a thousandth of that outside the galaxy. And the fact is that with the cosmic rays of 10 to the 19th, 10 to the 20th electron volts, uh, the charge of a proton or of a heavier nucleus, they would not be deflected significantly over the path distance of, uh, of oh, hundreds, thousands of light years, million light years. So they do represent the direction. Now, I'll just mention briefly that there is calculated to be a cutoff of the cosmic ray spectrum due to the interaction of the high energy, very high energy cosmic rays above 30 EeV or 310 to the 19th with the 2.7 degree Kelvin microwave back body, black body radiation. That is, above this energy, they would produce pi mesons in interacting with the black body radiation, and this would attenuate the flux. So you'd expect a fall off in intensity at those energies. Well, the uh, spectrum does show a fall off uh, above about 19 and a half uh, log, well, 10 to the 19 and a half EEV uh, or electron volts. And this shows it a little more explicitly. Um, okay. So the summary of the Yoge project. AGNs are a priori good candidates, and I won't go through uh, a lot of this, but uh, the energy spectrum, the GZK steepening, does seem to be there, uh, nanoisotropy regardless of the assumed sources, and so on. So let me summarize, and I think I've I exhausted my time, uh, what we have discussed. Uh, we discussed more details of other, other experiments, but there isn't had time. The overall conclusions, what we know so far and what we don't, have been covered. We still don't know the composition above a PEV very well, don't really understand the sources through the whole energy range as well as we would like. Early cosmic ray physicists discovered many new particles, and uh, Russian and Japanese physicists in cont particular continue to claim new phenomenon. But uh, I think we'll close here. I had a couple comments on radiation danger in space and so on. But uh, I think uh, we've run out of time, so I think we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.